beep. And also, as part of being a um, just a working session, uh, the intent was not to have a, a jabber scribe, okay, in, in the usual sense. It's really just us here in the room. The only problem is we really do need to plan to speak into a microphone because we do have remote participants, okay? So please try to hand around the microphones. Um, in fact, um, if we kind of get together, if there's something going on, you can, you know, grab the microphone out of the stand and just pass it in the group. I really want to try to make it convenient to be a working session. So you don't have to line up at the mic. We can pass a mic between each other. And we do have the two here. So if we need to have two and that makes it easier, let's just plan to do that. Okay, we're actually right at um, 1740 here. So again, this is the Registration Protocols Extensions Working Group. Um, as I said, the intent is to make this a working session, so there are no planned slides except that um, Roger did have an outline for the topic that he has here in terms of registry mapping, and he sent that to me a little while ago. Um, I'm going to take the time to put that into something that I can display, so I'll get it up on the screen and the remote participants can see it. I'm going to help. I'm going to turn this meeting over to Roger to walk through the discussion and make this a working session. I'll I'll try to manage the queue over here so that he doesn't have to be distracted by that, and I'll also try to get the um, slides. I'll try to keep them to the extent that we're using whatever's on the screen and the outline that he gave me. I'll I'll try to keep the on screen at that place for um, remote participants so that you can see what we're doing. And with that, um, let me turn it over to Roger. I'm going to hand out the blue sheets, and then I'll take care of getting some slides going. So Roger, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I think uh, we started talking about this maybe even last year in Chicago um, when we were trying to find out where to put uh, launch phase details into the fee um, mapping document. Uh, and we decided that it actually didn't belong there. So um, it was suggested that we actually find a new location for how to define what launch phase information is actually uh, required for um, a registry or a feed uh, in installation. So I'd, it was lucky that uh, VeriSign actually had already started this idea some time ago. Um, uh, and Jim actually suggested that we go and take a look at that and see if it works or not. Um, Jim and I have spent, I don't know, last six months back and forth probably um, looking at it and deciding that for the most part, it, if it fills what we were looking for um, with some slight changes uh, that we've already started making on it. Um, and this idea of the registry mapping is, is I suppose, twofold. It's uh, system level information so if you uh, if you're looking for your connections um, how many connections you have the timeouts on the connections and things you can find that in there um, but the the purpose that we were really digging into was um, some of the TLD more specific information that the registry mapping provides um, you know what what host names are are allowed what contacts what uh, uh, things like that but taking that one step further, it's also led to an extensible registry mapping where when a new extension comes in, uh, thinking of launch phase and fee, um, you can actually define those in this registry mapping and how that RFC was actually implemented by the registry for that TLD. So uh, we'll get to those details, but I just wanted to provide that high level um, item. May I? Please. So uh, just to be fair, um, he keeps saying Jim. And oh, although I, I do frequently go by Jim, um, I, it, it's only fair to acknowledge he's talking about Jim Gould here. He's not talking about me every time he says Jim at the moment. So I, I just wanted to be fair and, and, and acknowledge that the source of all of that. I should also acknowledge that our co-chair, Antoine Vershoren, is out there in the remote uh, uh, participation for this meeting. Uh, just wanted to make that known too. Anyway, I'm sorry. So oh, back to you. Thanks, James. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so let's just kind of run through what the, the current uh, registry mapping kind of looks like um, 
again, I, I sort of described it. The, the two main parts are the registry level system items and then TLD specific items um, or zones, I think it's called in the registry mapping. So uh, and again, the when you when you look at the, the core system items, it, it's not a lot of high or not a lot of information, but again, max connections, uh, idle time offs, absolute time, um, the command timeouts, those type of items are in that system level. Uh, and then when we get into the zone level, this really is about the GTLD and what it, you know, its parameters are set inside the SRS. Um, so it, when you get into the zone level, uh, you're talking about what services are, are available for that TLD, um, the deploy, deployment groups, uh, management information, um, like uh, create and update dates, um, the create and update clients. Um, other items are like batch jobs, shared object zones. So if there's certain things that get shared across one GTLD to the other, maybe you can share a contact from one to the other. So you can use one contact and you can put it in multiple different, or you know, use it in multiple TLDs. Um, let's see, uh, domain policies, obviously. Uh, and under that, um, you know, the domain name rules, uh, the rules around IDNs, um, the domain contact, what those uh, rules are, uh, name servers, child hosts, registration periods, uh, RGB periods, DNSSEC, uh, domain check policy, uh, and what the supported statuses are, uh, any, any rules around the auth info, uh, expiry policies. And again, these are all within the main core of a zone definition for uh, a TLD. So um, moving on from the domain policies, get into the host policies. Um, you know, what, what are the policies around internal host, external host? Can you share the IPs, um, items like that? Um, host check policy, uh, host naming rules, and again, the supported statuses for the host as well. Uh, moving on, we have the contact object as well. Uh, what rules are around the contact identifier? Uh, and again, any sharing policies on contacts, how they can be shared. Um, postal info rules, um, contact check policies. So how many checks can you do or how many contacts can you put in a check? Um, disclose, disclosure support policy. You know, do, does the TLD recognize the disclosure flag and won't disclose certain information? Um, again, supported statuses uh, and a privacy policy contact support. All right. And that's basically the core of uh, the registry mapping and uh, the, the big item that gets attached to this, of course, is the extensions. So when, when extension is created, um, you know, it, we, we, we can start to define those in this registry mapping. Um, and, and Jim Gould actually has already done a preliminary one of launch phase. So he went through the launch phase RFC and uh, pulled out everything that could be configurable off of that RFC. So all the mays and shoulds, all the options, um, he pulled all those pieces out and said, okay, for a TLD, you need to define these things and how the TLD implemented it. So if you look, look at the launch phase extension itself, um, you know, you, you, you're talking about uh, policies, including at the more, not at the RFC, but at the phase. So it's kind of an embedded, embedded policy where it's, you know, what, what type of phase is it? The name of the phase, uh, what modes, um, first come, first serve, um, pendings, uh, and is it an application or is it an actual registration create? Um, 
some other things are the start dates, uh, supported validators, um, supported launch phase statuses. Is, you know, are pending crates allowed? Is it um, the pull messaging policies, uh, supported mark val validation methods? Um, actually, Jim actually just mentioned to me that, you know, there's multiples in there. I never thought about it. There's multiples in there. So, um, okay. yep, please. So, sorry for the interruption. Anyone have any, have the magic HDMI to, uh, to, to Mac adapters? I did not pick one up from the registration desk. I didn't realize they don't have the dongles. Uh, if nobody does, I can I could go to the desk and, and get it, but I think I'll just stay for this. Um, I did upload uh, the document that he gave me with the outline that he's reading from here into the meeting materials. So you could go to the meeting materials for this meeting and you'll find the outline of discussion uh, up there. Let me see if Avery is able to help me here. Sorry, back to you. Thanks. Um, and really, I, again, he went through all these and, and just went through it item by item and pulled out all the, the mays and shoulds. So probably one of the big things to talk about is, um, is this policy concept of when a, when a extension is created, we all sit here and talk about it and, and design it and everybody has to add, you know, one or two pieces to it. Uh, but that implementation is not, that you always have to do those things. It's we went through the fee document, um, and Jody probably can talk to this better than me. But when we were implementing fee, what seven, five years ago? Um, even though the fee document isn't even done, but when we implemented it five years ago, every registry that we worked with, we had to sit down with them, and they kept asking us, "Well, what about this piece of the fee document? Do you need this one? And do you need this one?" So we had to go through with every registry and said, you know, we don't use it. I mean, you guys can implement it if you want. Uh, the document, you know, makes it optional or whatever. Um, but, you know, we don't implement, you, you know, we're not going to use it. So we went through this process with, you know, 300 different companies and had to go through and, and do the same process with them. Um, what this will do actually is provide that information um, at, at each TLD, so all 1,200 TLDs that are coming will provide that exact information that we need that we can do it with, and we don't have to go back and forth and miss one with one registry and pick it up with the next one. So, so I don't know, Jim, did you have anything you wanted to speak specifically on for an introduction, I guess, and we can get into questions? Yeah, what I would say is that... Um, the experience of um, being an author of the launch phase extension and then trying to take that and create a policy extension out of it was uh, very worthwhile. I just got to say, as we go through these internet drafts, we keep throwing stuff in. I mean, in essence, you'll, you'll see it. You know, you saw it in the registry fee extension. Uh, things are getting thrown in, and in essence, you're going to implement it as a registry the way that you're going to implement it based on the option that you chose. But the point is, is that um, in the case of the launch phase policy, there were 15 different mays and shoulds and lists and that sort of thing that was thrown in there. So um, as an author, really clarified all the things and all the thought that went in there, but it adds to the complexity for the registrar. So in essence, even if you didn't do this extension, you probably want to document it in some place, right? You want to have an artifact that defines exactly how it is that you're, how you implemented a particular extension. Um, but for me personally, it, uh, I prefer to write it in code than it is to write it in a Word doc that goes to legal. So <laughs> just in my choice, but I think it's worthwhile to go through that exercise anyways um, as a, an author of one of these uh, extensions. Hey, that's a good point. I mean, that's, it's something you bring up. I mean, as you, I mean, for, the fee document, I don't know, it's about four years old now, I think, from the original. Um, and, you know, I didn't get heavily involved in it until last year. So there was a lot of things in there already that, and it's probably doubled in size since, you know, the beginning of last year. So it's all those, I, I don't know if you call them compromises, but agreements that, yeah, it needs to do this and it should do that. And they need it over there. So let's put it in there kind of features 
that just need to be documented somewhere. So I agree the policy document really pulls that out and probably really helps, you know, when you start to think about true implementation of it. And it's like, oh, yeah, so how do you technically do that then? I mean, everybody agreed that, yeah, it makes sense to do that in the RFC. But, you know, okay, now that we actually have to make it work, how do you make it work? So. So, yeah, one, one other item is the fact that this would, in essence, result in two extensions for every extension. Oh, yeah. Right? So just think about this. So if you create an extension around on a registry fee, in essence, by creating a policy extension of the registry object as opposed to uh, an extension of a domain, what you're doing is that by defining the policies of how you're implementing an extension, you're pretty much creating another extension of something different, right? So you may think that it's doubling your work, but to me personally, that it's something that you should be doing anyways. Um, actually, when I create an extension, I typically will always, always implement it myself on both sides. I want to understand how it works or how it doesn't work. I look at all the different options. But be able to capture that in something that's um, concrete that can be consumed by software, I think is uh, really beneficial. So I don't want to start with a negative, the fact <laughs> that there's two extensions instead of just one. But I think it's, it's absolutely necessary. Okay, um, that's really the high level um, overview of what the registry mapping is um, intended to be. I don't know if anybody has questions, concerns. I mean, I, I think Jim brought up the biggest concern that I mean, I can see authors having is, is really, it, it creates two documents for every uh, extension that you create, so. Well, does it? Does it have to be two documents? It doesn't have to be two documents, right? I mean, I guess that's the question you're trying to get on the tape on the floor here, right? Yeah, and it, and it's something we actually have talked about is, you know, do they need to be two separate documents? Um, can it be a section within one document that explains all this? I, the, the, <laughs> Alex Mayo was speaking, like thirty centimeters above. A ground level. Um, my my general impression. I have been reading through the word document that you that you posted on the meetings materials, and um, I think that I know roughly the internals of the domain name registry. But some of the words that you mentioned there, I have no idea what they actually are. So um, batch jo batch jobs is one of the. Uh, words or, or, or points on that word document. I don't know what, what I would need to describe there. I understand <laughs> you like created that from that Excel sheet that you sent to most of the registries. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a living experience of what you require from registries. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, actually the, the batch I was feedback so, from. Maybe quickly five seconds. So I think before we, we, we can work on, on the document, we, we should actually, uh, understand or at least some of us should understand what each of these items actually are unless the extension is so generic um then essentially it's a key value pair that says batch job domain expiration yes whatever that means yeah you know what i mean i would say that yeah we need to agree on the terminology yeah i think number one i thought that it was well i guess in my mind it, it was known but obviously it's not um so just to let you know the fact is that um it's, it's generally something that we're going to run on a schedule. Uh, the the mo the most important one that we have is the uh, the delete batch that runs at a specific time that will actually purge the domains from the system. But the timing of those batches is really important for the registrars uh, to know when you know like the not or renew is going to occur. When when the domain is going to get deleted? When is a transfer going to get auto approved? You know when are those batches that run on a schedule execute? That's what that particular section is about. So if you have another term that is better for that, it'd be great to know. Yeah, and this is Roger. Uh, Alex, yeah, I think it, for the for the core items, it's definitely not going to be a key value pair. I mean, they're, they're set items, so. Um, Chris from 
for our association. Um, we definitely are supportive of this. We'll be kind of asking uh, for something like this. Right? Um, of course, I think the pitfall is always, what if the registries implement this extension differently, right? Then kind of, so we need to be, if, if we define something, it needs to be strict enough that there is little room for interpretations. Um, the second thing, I, I think it would be great to have an extension that we can use, for example, you have XML and you can you can generate a number of uh, test commands that you can send. If you can automatically generate some of your commands, at least some of your commands for registries, that would be extremely helpful to, to the registers because you can just put the case in and take all the data, immediately feed their system, try to connect, see if there's any bugs, etc. around all the test cases, and then immediately they're they're far further into having this in. Yeah, um, we're definitely any Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think you make a good point. Again, going along with what Alex said, that core set has got to be something that everybody agrees to. And then again, maybe not everybody implemented every one of those items, but agree that that's what that is and that's what it's for. <laughs> You're too kind. Oh, come up here, Scott. This one's a little higher. No, this is okay. Uh, Scott Holland back. Um, in terms of the question of do we do this in two documents or do we do it in one, I've got a very strong preference for trying to find a way to do it in one. It just, you know, from an overhead perspective, makes things much easier. And if that means that we as a group um, you know, think a little bit about adopting some kind of a convention for what we might expect to see in terms of a section, you know, in an extension document that addresses this, uh, that would be time well spent. Thanks, Scott. Um, this is Roger. I, I, we, we went through this discussion, and one thing we kept coming back to was how complicated will, how complex will that one document get, and will it get confusing when it's talking about mays and coulds and shoulds, and, and, and then you get into a section that is detailing all those out. Does that complicate, you know, how, how that first draft is written? Okay, um, any other questions? Online, any questions? No? Does everybody understand, I suppose, the goal here? And is it a good goal? Something that the group would like to move forward with? Some of the questions that we've got. Yeah, thanks. Alex, here again. Maybe I, I can try summarizing in a single sentence. The goal is to transport the configuration of the registry and all aspects of that in EPP, yeah? between registry and registry. That's a good summarization of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Alex does it. It's a nice understand goal. it. Yeah, this is one of the it's a nice goal. Um, it's it's a hard one, I guess. Yeah, because there's so many ways to do something in a different way. Yeah, yeah and again, I, I think that the the core piece of it will probably be the hard part to do and get everybody agreed that and these are the main things everybody does. The the extension, you know, adding extensions in is probably pretty easy because it is a little more dynamic. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the core would be the where we'd spend our time trying to get. Uh, agreement on what that actually means, and you know, it, it, does everybody call it that or not? As long as it, you know the 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 I guess the meaning behind it is known. Alex, again, um, I try not to be the elephant in the room, but uh, shall we include information regarding privacy policy uh, with regards to what type of data is being published on the other hand as well? Or is that just the provisioning end? <laughs> so which of the data is going to end up in who is? Yeah? That's interesting. I mean, again, one of the 
items in EPP was the disclosure flag. So you, you're starting to touch right. on it, but is it more? Yeah. I would actually try to stay away from that. On the other hand, my question is, would that configuration information be incomplete to you then? Yeah. I, I would uh, respond to that and say that it's around provisioning. Uh, if there was an extension, like for example, like you had said, that the, the disclosure element that outlines you know, what is possible, uh, that that way, what, how the registry implements that particular feature would be described in this particular uh, extension. Uh, so I'm not sure if you want to go beyond that, that boundary, yeah. I think that most, most registries, at least that I've been talking with in the CCTLD world, might want to go beyond of what's possible with the disclosed flags. Yeah. Some yeah. of them might not even display a handle or a contact ID for a domain in Boulder. Yeah, part of my concern as well in doing something like this is trying to capture every possible combination of, of implementation that may be kind of what I would call a snowflake kind of one-off, potentially. Uh, the issue is that for us to have something that's common uh, across those, I would see that if there are some registries that do things in a very unique way, then maybe we want to create a separate extension of this to be able to communicate their particular unique policy. So um, I wouldn't want to bake this and make it so big to cover every possible little nuance, but. So um, what you're saying is that we are going for the PD20 principle. Exactly. exactly, yes, that's right. Just to add on to that, Alex, 80-20, where you can still define the 20 just on the side of it. So it's not, it's not that we had to agree with every the 20 here it, it's an extension that you can add into it. Yeah, since it's an object in EPP, you can create command response extensions for that. So therefore, you can define whatever it is you want, define your policy. Chris, um, one of the ways maybe to, to prevent uh, people from, from writing whatever they want and causing interoperability is if, if there is a way um, that allows you to generate uh, XMAP from you have an XML definition, and then you can in, in the, uh, define the, the extension. Of course, each registry can define it on their own, and they say, okay, our fee extension is supposed to look like this. Therefore, here is what you should use to generate, or the command create, this, uh, what you should send to us. So then the, your system can read it and immediately generate what should be sent. So in, in a way, it kind of bypasses people. If, if I write something, value for example, okay, someone has to actually look at it and say, okay, we have to look at this and this, but if it's, if it's code, it can work out the approach. And, and we prevent the problem of, uh, okay, they define something strange or something uncommon. Actually, we've already implemented our proprietary version of this, and you know, with 150 plus TLDs, yeah, we have everything data-driven uh, to be able to generate a policy, uh, but the intent is to help the registrars to be able to see those variances between those TLDs so that therefore the registrar can auto configure their side of things. And we have, we use this ourselves for our own monitors. So knowing what like launch phase particular TLD is in and what can and can't be done um, is very, very useful. Um, so yeah, it's, it's gotta be data driven as much as possible. Good. All right, uh, we, we did have a few, uh, I guess, suggestions, questions that have come up uh, since we started talking about this. Um, uh, Anton actually brought up um, a question. I think the last time we talked on this was, you know, should the key relay mapping RFC be included in here? Um, and, and I think that the easy answer is yes. Uh, the hard answer is, uh, you know, is it an extension or is it in the core? And to me, it, it seems simple enough just to make it part of the extension, you know, leave it out of the core. Um, you know, that, that's just my opinion. But. Actually, Anton might be able to describe this. So uh, I'd like to know what options there are in the key relay that you would want to communicate in something like this. It may be just that the TLD supports it. Yes or no. If it's a yes or no, 
then the core already supports that because already enlists the uh, the XML namespaces supported by that particular TLD. So if you connect to a registry that supports 150 TLDs, you're going to see an aggregate of all the different um, extensions supported by that system. But in essence, you want to be able to query for a particular extension. I mean, it's particular TLD what is supported. So in essence, if key relay was only supported by a subset of those TLDs on the system, you would be able to identify that. But if there's more than that, then you'd be able to identify those specific specific options in the key relay that would be useful. Okay. Um, and, and actually, Patrick gave us quite a few different, um, at least talking points to look at. Um, he brought up uh, a few different attributes of the zones. Um, the rules around domain names, uh, number and type of objects, and uh, policies on unlinked object relations, which is an interesting one because we've been talking about that for a little while now. As you know, what, what are the deletion rules around an object that's been sitting there, not associated to anything for a year? You know, is it you know after six months you get rid of it? You know, if it's not linked, it's it's an interesting one. It, I think could be useful in there. Alex? Alex again. Um, I'm, I'm trying to turn my head around the fact that this can actually be depending on other facts. Like for example, uh, registries can introduce new IDN scripts, yeah? Which changes that rule. But in turn, registries might want to introduce those IDN scripts in like a uh, Sunrise style. So we have like combinations of those things. And I have no idea how we could ever convey that in a machine readable format that would enable you to like press a button and say, yeah, oh, oh it is enabling Cyrillic yeah, next month and okay. its applications. So yeah. it's interesting. So we could either focus on the like, I, I like to say the stable operations mode of the registry and try to include like valid from valid to uh, style things. Or we could go for the venture to actually try and look at whether we can manage to represent those combinations. There will be a launch phase with blah, UIDN script that creates applications. I I'll respond to that one. Um, actually, the launch phase is pretty unique in the fact that it has schedules, defined schedules. Something like what you're talking about, I believe that uh, may be better suited where in essence, there's an updated date for the policy. So the idea is the fact that there's two different forms of getting policy information for what we call the zone. One is to get a list of all the zones. And then there's an updated date in there to be able to support updating your cache on the client. So in essence, if you've loaded it all up, then let's say that we change the IDN policy which is say, right? And let's say that we're able to encode the ID and policies effectively inside the, the zone. Uh, what you'd be able to do is uh, do a query, find out that it's been updated, then query for the specifics, right? So in essence, what you would be doing is that you would be having the data provided from the <coughs> response to be able to drive your logic. Instead of saying, I'm gonna schedule ahead of time and look at you know, at this particular date, you'll be able to do it dynamically. In that instance, not, not in the case of launch phases. Okay. Uh, another thing Patrick brought, brought up was the, uh, um, the EPP transport content, uh, number of connections, which I think is obvious, um, timeouts, um, and to me, those were the, the obvious system ones that we actually had in there. I don't know if they're TLD ones would be specific or not. So, um, uh, reg start uh, content. Uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, password policies, you know, lifetime of pass password. Um, can you reuse them? Complexity, things like that. Is that something that we could design into this? Um, so that it's defined and you know, anytime anybody logs in, they know, hey, the password expires in 30 days. So um, 
uh, it's another context that is useful today is obviously fairly manual. Um, we just went through it um, with Phileas uh, not too long ago, uh, but another good idea, I think so. Since this is a working session, I can interrupt, so Mikey. Um, I have a, an idea with two things. One thing is I think we should reuse previous work. So I don't know whether there is some XML or whatever that describes a password policy. If such a thing exists, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. For example, IDN scripts, we should use LGR, yeah? Um, because that's already existing um, and there are groups actually describing the policies for various scripts. So if possible, we, we could include LGR here. And the second thing is, since there are so many of those things, we should maybe at one point go through all those things and try to figure easy, not that easy, but doable, hard, very hard, yeah? And then decide which of the things we would want to include, the most pressing ones, I would say. If the most pressing ones are the ones that are very hard to do, uh, then we have a problem. If the most, mo if eighty percent of the most pressing ones are the easy ones, uh, then let's go for the easiest ones first and try to move up from there. So you're thinking the hardest, technically to solve, yeah, and balancing that against the the cost of the cost how of it's currently being done, basically cost of collecting it manually, yeah. yeah, on both sides. Yeah, what I would be asking for is the other registries specifically out there. Take a look at this. Um, a lot of the elements in here make sense to me uh, because, you know, we at VeriSign went ahead and implemented it, so that matches our way of doing things. But um, ours, is not the o ours is not the only way. So it would be great if other registries take a look at this and, and think about what kind of policies you have on your end that could be communicated to the registrars in a structured way. If you can't, you may want to think about it. I'm just, just throwing it out there. If you can't represent your policy in a way that's easily consumable, then it, I mean, it may be too complex of a policy, right? But take a look at this and see if it's something that is missing, something that could be adjusted, because uh, the idea here is to be able to come up with one way that uh, registries can do this. Good. So, um, Jim Galpin, just speaking for myself here. Um, since uh, I guess I want to say two things. Uh, first, just in response to uh, Jim Gould there immediately, uh, you know, we are carefully looking at this, you know, we, Phileas, and trying to decide what we want to do here and if we want this to work. This particular registrar content stuff and password policies. Not actually sure this belongs here. I, I think it probably belongs somewhere else. I just don't have an alternative to suggest at the moment. So, you know, with that in mind, it's okay to talk about what this might look like because even if we move it somewhere else, we will have had the discussion about what this kind of this kind of information looks like. And so, um, you know, I mean, I, I like the fact that we we have an opportunity to talk about this line item. And the second thing is, yeah, you know. Um, since Roger just mentioned that uh, you know they, uh, meaning meaning GoDaddy and and us affiliates, we actually tried to go through a a password change for all of the registrars that are with us for all of our TLDs, and found that to be I'll just call it an interesting exercise. Um, so we're very interested in trying to find a way to better manage this kind of information. Um, I'm not sure it belongs in this registry mapping, but at some point it's either going to go here or we'll have a suggestion on, on a different kind of framework to do that. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for discussion. Since all of this is just under discussion, it's, it's fine to just take that in for right now. I'll jump in on that one. Um, actually, I kind of think that it does belong in this. Um, it may be that uh, warning messages and that sort of thing about expiring password would be more for an extension of the login response or something, but in the case of defining policy, if you're going to, on the registry side, expect a, a password to, to be changed every 90 days, right? That would be a basic system level policy uh, that you could communicate to the registrar um, so their systems are aware of it. So I guess the interesting, the, the distinction that I would make and, and why this is just sort of a discussion for us is 
are we talking about the registry as a service provider so that, I mean, for example, you like us, you know, we have a couple hundred TLDs, you know, um, so are these policies about that or are they about a TLD? Because on the one hand, um, it's not clear that these passwords are per TLD, which is what the whole mapping is for, um, as opposed to that. And I, I think it's it's just, it's an interesting distinction. And if we're going to come up with a framework to sort of manage these things, we have to decide what that distinction is going to mean and, and how that would apply to this particular content. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. And actually, uh, uh, based on the connection policy and the uh, timeouts and that sort of thing, those are system level. Um, and that was added. So there's a different area for a system. And then the system contains many uh, zones or TLDs. And then you can have specific policies at the TLD level. So it supports both. And in the case of the launch phase, what uh, Roger had referred to is the fact that it's a, a sub element of a TLD. So a TLD has many phases. So when you look at the policies of a phase, they're unique per phase. But there's no way that it will limit, limit it in this way. But in essence, what winds up happening is that by having a system level set of policies, have a TLD level policy, and even have the option for sub policies that it can do. I think in terms of the password policy, I do think it is, it is actually a good thing because there is typically in a registrar, um, there are various people working, of course, and some people minus the relationship with TLDs uh, and some people minus the technical aspects of it. And every time there's something like a password change, it has to go through multiple people until it reaches the, the responsible person that can actually change the password. If the system can already notify immediately the technical person that there's a change of a policy pattern changes or something, uh, then that, that will smooth a lot of things over. Yeah, one item that we discussed uh, actually today was whether or not this would be strictly policy. Uh, like for example, you could say, yeah, if the passwords expire every 90 days. The other is that it could tell you based on your login when your password's going to expire next based on that request, right? That may be better suited for a separate extension related to uh, telling you proactively that your password is about to expire. Um, but it could be done that. So I'm not sure whether or not that's something that you just put as policy within this extension and then you put the other somewhere else. So, I mean, I'll complicate this even further. I mean, there, there are multiple passwords that may or may not apply at different times in all of this, which is part of why we're into this, right? I mean, there's the EPP passwords and the connections there. Um, registrars have access to portals, you know, on our, on our website, and there are different passwords that go with that. There are uh, multiple role-based passwords that go, and this is why, uh, for us, it's a, it's a larger question of an overall framework for dealing with authentication. And whatever we do here, just needs to fit into that larger framework. Um, and you know that's kind of why I bring it up. I mean, it makes sense, I, I agree, to a first order, since this is about EPP and you're talking about credentials for EPP, and sure, I don't want to disagree that it should go here. There may or may not be more things to say there. Um, so I'm just observing that we're thinking about it in a, in a larger framework is all, and want to open the door for, you know, that there may be something else that this, this work has to relate to for, uh, you know, to, for it to make sense. Well, actually, you, you bring up a good point now. If this is broader than the actual system, yeah. say that, you know, for FTP or whatever other passwords that would be there, I don't think this, that would be applicable to this. And actually, this is specific to each system. So in essence, each if you have multiple registry systems, um, each registry system would return back the policies of that system and any TLDs on that system. So in essence, if you were looking for a central place to look at all the systems, and then all the TLDs within all those systems, then that would be even a bigger problem where, in essence, the, the password, broader password issue may apply. But this is kind of targeted per system. So in essence, when a registrar connects to a registry system, this would be targeted for that one system and not talking about a different system. So I'm not sure whether or not there would be a desire to have it be broader than that, but I'm thinking that might be too big. Right. Well, and then in those lines, if we go down into uh, another layer, so we're talking, we've sort of casually thrown out the idea that you might tell the 
tell the client when they log in that their password is about to expire. Well, if we're talking about an EPP client, and this is an EPP server on the other side, uh, there's probably no place for that kind of notification. That notification probably needs a different mechanism to get out there so that the registrar knows, that kind of thing. That's why I'm thinking about a, a different framework for dealing with credentials that there's a relationship here, but you know, I'm not sure that all the details are in here or not. No, I'm actually with you on this one. Uh, yeah. So I would say put the policy in here, but things like warnings about expiry of passwords, expiry of certificates, expiry of, of or insecure cipher suites, and that sort of thing could be an extension or a login security yeah. extension or whatever it is that would provide additional information in the, in the login response, uh, which would be more useful and more real time than it is taking a look at policy of that system. I think that's my thought. All right, so I agree, thanks. And just a time check, 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, okay, any further questions, comments? Chris is coming up. Yes, it's all the way into the mic. <laughs> so the, the poll messages can already be used to send some sort of communication question. Does the system of the registrar recognize what this poll message is? It's a whole other story, but um, if we want to send something, I, I, I would say it doesn't make sense to make an extension since this, this already exists. And I know that lots of registries are, are sending somewhat of this type of poll message. It's not exactly a notification of the password, but things that are not within the spectrum of what is typically in there. So, uh, Jim Calvin, Jim Gould will come up next just to say, I mean, poll messages are, in, are interesting because, um, and, and I'm sure that Jim Gould would say something similar, registrar's uh, willingness um, to actually react and uh, take on board poll messages uh, varies quite broadly, shall we say. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, as, as a registry, and we're very much in favor of trying to migrate more things to poll messages, um, as opposed to individual email messages and other kinds of things, because there's greater opportunity for automation and, and uh, you know, a uh, little more um, uh, stability and, and standardization in it. But I, I think the problem that we have is um, we kind of have to do that a little bit at a time would be what I'd say, because not all registrars are, are the same. They don't all react to the poll messages. So we have to begin to figure out how to get traction in the parsing of poll messages and get more registrars on board with doing the right thing. Um, and that's that's a that's a real problem for us, especially with uh, with smaller registrars. I mean, GoDaddy obviously is not a problem in that respect, but uh, there are many that are. Um, Actually, what I would say is that I equate the poll queue as to email. So in essence, imagine that you're, uh, a client is on your website and they have to change their password. You probably tell them right there on, on your web page and send an email. Um, so I think it would be better if you're able to return the information right within the response to the login. Because that way what you can do is provide additional uh, information related to that particular connection. Like what, like I said, whether or not your certs are going to expire, whether or not the cipher suites are insecure, those sorts of things could be returned. Um, but again, I don't think that's related to the registry mapping because I think that's policy. Calfire, uh, some of this material relates to actually connecting to the registry in the first place. How do we bootstrap this? Um, how do you communicate a password policy before you have a password? How do you communicate um, certificate information or, or cipher suites before you've connected to the registry in the first place? Thanks, Cal. Uh, were you talking to Jody? Because I think he brought this up before as well. Um, yeah, that, that's that's a good question as to uh, how you can do that. Because one of the, the biggest problems that registrars have is is really onboarding the TLD. So uh, by the time we get a password into this system, uh, we've answered the 500 questions that we needed answered. So it, it, is, it is something that we need to look at and figure out how, you know, where does that information set? Can you get an OT&E uh, that describes the production system? Um, I, I don't know. It's, it's something that we've been throwing back and forth at how we can do that. So good question. And, and I'll tell you that 
you know, we thought about this issue ourselves because we'd very much like to do something like this. I mean, this would just be a super thing. And I'm, I'm sure that you guys would think of it the same way. And, and that, is, that is an issue. You know, I mean, there's a certain manual process associated with onboarding a registrar. And what you want to do is find a way to get to a point where you can set them up so they can just go do this and get it automated. Um, and at what point does that, where is that point in time in all of the set of manual things that you do? Um, and we haven't decided that yet. So, um, but that is a discussion we have to have and we're hoping to bring, you know, we, we'll give that some thought and decide what we think and we should have some discussion maybe. It isn't really clear if we're gonna try to standardize that point in time or not, or if that'll be left for individual registries to decide, but it would be a good point of discussion at some point. This is a crazy idea because I was I was just saying I hate Word documents, but I think <laughs> honestly this is consumable uh, definition. So in essence, whether or not you were to formally define it in a structure like this and put it into a, an artifact that then could be slurped in and then used to configure, you could do it in batch instead of doing it real time. Not that I'm suggesting it that way, but it's consumable, All right? So a related idea about this is what happens when this changes, the policy change, if the policy changes over time, you know, you'd really like to set up an automated way to alert registrars that there's been a change and they should go grab it again. Or should they just grab it each time? And there's a policy for that. Yeah, no, yes, that's, that was the purpose of the updated date, honestly. Yeah. So the point is, is that you would expect uh, the registrar to be able to periodically query efficiently, which provides a list not all the detail with an updated date and they see that it's been changed, I would anticipate that the registrars would cache it on their end. So you see it this change, then you can go and query and reset your configuration. Right. So. No, that's it's a that's actually a good point. And how do you announce that that change is upcoming as well? <laughs> Jody, go ahead. Your mouth is moving, but we cannot hear you. <laughs> Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Nice and loud. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it, yeah, one of the, one that maybe one of the options would be to be able to add a this to be updated uh, add an attribute in there to say that. Um, the registry mapping will be updated at this time for this TLD. Uh, it, j just a thought in case, it, it, you know, if it's going to be updated in three days, put the next updated date in there. So, I, I mean, I think in principle, I, I agree with you. There, there needs to be some kind of uh, early alert that a change is coming as well as the fact that it changes. But it, it still just brings us back to this, this basic problem about uh, you know whether people, even if you automate that and put it in here, and I do think that it should be there, um, you know, we really do need to migrate people to dealing with it in an automated way. And that really is a, a bigger problem for us. Um, we do wanna have that and have that feature. Um, but you know, how do we move the community to, to doing it in that way is, is kind of the issue. Yeah, the only way I could see that working is kind of the way that the launch phase um, policy extension was done where you're like segmenting it off to allow for multiple by dates and that gets a lot more complex. I got to tell you by implementing this, yes, it's data driven, but in essence, you have to like restructure your data to be by schedule. So in essence, when you're going to schedule your deployment of your new logic, you're going to have to like load it up. I'm saying it, it's technically feasible. You could do it. It's definitely uh, much more complex to produce and to consume. Five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking similar lines, Jim. That it. it Which Jim? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, that the. I mean, it, it seems simple enough that there there could be an attribute in here that says, "Hey, there's a future um, mapping coming up." 90 days from now, you know, I could say on August 1st, there's going to be a new mapping. And then technically the registrar could call in and say, 
give me the mapping for August 1st. Hang on. It, again, a lot harder, but can you actually do that? I have to, I don't remember in detail enough if we, you know, can you, can I actually ask for a mapping of a particular date? That would be kind of interesting. Uh, I'm not sure that, that even the, the spec that you guys had would let you do that, but yeah. I, anyway, yeah, it, it's a it's a good topic for, for discussion to figure some of this stuff out. I mean, especially since for, for CCTLDs, I mean, they're they're sort of individually different. I mean, for us and, and you guys too, you have GTLDs. A lot of things, especially certain changes, are are uh, have mandated notification periods. You know, so all this stuff has to be sort of tied together into your processes. You got 90 days out, 60 days out, that kind of stuff. It's all there are just issues in making all of this work right. Hello, this is Ulrich from IS. Um, uh, are we really talking about to fully automate the running of a EPP client adapting to different registries, changing to specifications on the fly, kind of automated code generation, whatever, to do this? Is that the goal? Go so a, a client would, you know, like deploy a new style of connecting whatever without going through testing just by getting the new definition online so this is jim galvin and I'll, I'll give you my partial answer to that others may have a different point of view in, in fairness what i imagine this registry mapping encompassing is all standard extensions um and and yes a standard registry plus uh, extensions that are known and documented and standardized. The reality is there are registries which are going to not map right onto this thing. They'll be different for whatever reason. There'll be things which are unique to them which won't necessarily be standardized, that kind of thing. So, I mean, all of that applies. Um, what I do imagine is that, um, at least for us, when, when we have a new service that we're launching, you always have to go through uh, testing or you have to go through pre-delegation testing. So not pre-delegation testing. You do have to go to OTE. That's the right thing. <laughs> that's pre-delegation. Right, you have to go to pre-delegation testing. <laughs> yeah. At IIS, but you know that's a different story. Right. But but I think as 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 uh, as the other Jim, <laughs> I'll be the Jim. He can be the other Jim. Uh, uh, said uh, you know you can imagine these things being available in, in OTE first. You know so that registrars can connect and do their thing and do their own testing and you know then they can you know make their appointments for for being accredited for doing things the the um, the ability of a registrar to do anything that's in a mapping is dependent on the registrar having been accredited to do that and so that's a separate check that the registry has to do on its side even if you see the whole thing you you may not be able to do things so um, there's yeah there's there's still some steps in there it's not fully automated because there, there are some particular decision points that have to be made that are outside the scope of the mapping. I don't know if that helps or not. And now we'll let, um, I'll, I'll, now I'll be the, the be, other Jim and be, he can be, be DJ. No, no, but because what, what I think is if we're talking about, now what you say is, okay, we will have this OTNE system where we do it all first, then we don't have, you know, the, the, we can reduce the complexity in the, in the extension because we're not expecting it to, Fully automated work. Well, we actually expecting that there is the system aware of the changes coming. So, I mean, that makes it a lot easier in terms of definition that we want to do. What we're saying is we have an OTP, well, we put in the new things, we have a client connecting, see that it does the right thing, and then the, the actual extension on the production system will somehow tell them, okay, now we change, today we, at this point in time, we're changing to the new thing, but the system is already aware of it because it's gone through testing. So well, we'll, put, saying, well, hold on. Uh, we'll put it this way, uh, we, like I said, we currently use this today in, in our monitors. So in essence, our monitors have to react based on what's going on in the registry, and based on changes in phases, changes in policy. So in essence, yeah, in a perfect world, Yes, you would auto configure the whole thing and be able to react based on changes. And if you're saying that you need to be able to certify that on the client side before that change occurs, well, that's what the other Jim said. We said the other Jim said <laughs> that that's why you do have a separate environment to be able to do that kind of testing. So at least you're getting a notice 
you have an environment to go to to test it out beforehand before the change actually does occur, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I guess the only closing comment that I would make is, at least from our point of view, the intent is to automate things to the greatest extent possible, but there are some manual decision points that have to happen along the way in this. Um, and that's just because some of this is based on contracts, you know? I mean, making extensions, you need approvals, got to be accredited, all that stuff. And that's outside the scope of automation. So there are limits, but we certainly like to automate it, as you said, to the greatest extent possible. Okay. And, yeah, and, and the time check is we are now at, at yeah. the end of our hour. Um, so I'll give you a moment to. Yeah, I was just going to mention, I was just going to say yes. Now the word out of time. I, I, good discussion today. Uh, again, I think, I think that the reason we brought this uh, and continued, I, I think we tried once before to bring this forward um, is we do want the group working on, we do want these questions, you know, we want to say, oh yeah, but what about this? You know, can, can we build for that or not? And how automated can we make those things? You know, from again, the earlier mentioned for GoDaddy, this will be great because, you know, we'll, we'll put the resources to automating this. We do have to make considerations for the other registrars that don't have the ability to adapt to this. So we can't say, yes, you know, you're going to configure your system by reading this. Well, you know, a few registrars may, and you still have that manual process for other registrars as well. So I'll turn it back over to the gym. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Um, so the blue sheets are up here. If you haven't signed a blue sheet, please come up and do that. And we will see everybody on Wednesday. And I should know off the top of my head when the meeting is on Wednesday, but I actually don't. But it is one of these late afternoon meetings again, too. But we have a 90-minute uh, time slot at that time. And so we'll have a, a more uh, formal, structured uh, working group meeting then um, with, with some discussion. So other than that, thanks very much, everyone. See you on Wednesday. Yes, absolutely. That makes sense. Yes, okay. yes it does. Yes it does. We should, we should adopt the work, the, uh, the work item. <laughs>